Welcome. Uh, this is the introduction to Wikimedia Cloud Services talk. I'm Madhuri, this is Brian and Chase, and they work with me on the Cloud Services team at the Wikimedia Foundation. And uh, we work on infrastructure and platform as a service things for uh, the Wikimedia movement projects, and it's built by us and Andrew, who's on our team, and a lot of lot more volunteer developers from the community. Um, so, what is Cloud Services? Um, basically, we are a hosting platform, which means that if you have software that has anything to do with the Wikimedia movement, we have computing resources for you to host it. Um, there is, on top of that, we provide a lot more abstractions to make it easy if you have a web service to host, if you have an API that you want to run somewhere, you have a little bot, you have a visualization that you don't know where to put, um, you write a query and you want to just run it against our public databases, we have tools and services that help abstract all those things and that's kind of what the second thing that talks about. And then all of these, the platforms that, and services that we offer, we offer technical and community support in terms of documentation, talking on IRC to people, helping them, um, tracking bugs and responding on Fabricator, which is the platform that we use for tracking feature requests and bugs, um, and responding there. That's all the technical and community support stuff that we do. Um, one thing that I want to add is that this is super big and friendly. You can ask questions at any time, so be fine. And you can stop me if I'm using any words that are jargony to you and ask. There's no questions that are not meant to be asked, except why the word cloud you. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll cover that. Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, so these are all the products that we offer um, and started Cloud BBS, which is the foundational um, infrastructure that we have. It is an OpenStack-based hosting platform, and OpenStack basically is this big piece of cloud software that helps you uh, cluster a bunch of different servers together and offer virtual machines, which are lightweight computers or servers that you can log into and install and run things on. Um, so that's the underlying infrastructure on top of which we run all of the other stuff there. Um, Toolforge is the next thing uh, in which we run tools. But it happens to me. Um, and tools could be the things that I talked about before, which are um, a web application that you wrote, a, a bot, or a job that you want to run every two hours, every minute. Um, anything like that, you just don't want to handle the underlying server, don't want to install stuff, you just put it in, you write a tool, you put it on, you post it on Toolforge, and we manage that stuff. Um, query and pause are things that actually run on top of either VPS or Toolforge, and both of them are GUI, graphical interface tools, that have query allows you to run web uh, run SQL queries on the web using a web interface, <coughs> and it runs it against the wiki replica stuff that's over there, which is the public replicas of our production database servers. All the media wiki databases are there. And pause is kind of similar to a uh, query in that it's also a graphical interface, but it's a uh, Jupyter notebooks. And I do not know how many of you know about Jupyter Notebooks, it could be one more explanation. Um, it's basically, uh, you can write Python in a graphical interface, so you can just, I maybe you can show it later at the end. You just log on to this website and it gives you a little page, or a little terminal where you just write Python and it compiles it for you. And you can also access our databases and stuff through it. Um, the wiki replicas, tools, DB, and dumps are all data services that we offer that are kind of one layer beneath everything else. And we have a, I think, more detailed architecture-ish diagram later that we can cover in more detail uh, about. And tools, DB allows people to store data in a MySQL data store. It's just a MySQL database as a service. And dumps is all of the public Wikimedia dumps that you can get from dumps.wikimedia.org that we can 
allow you to access to any of the services that you use in our platform. Um, there's some cool stats around there. Uh, just to show off how much our stuff is used, in that <laughs> these are all the OpenStack projects down here on the left, 213 projects and 715 instances. Um, those are the Cloud VPS projects, and Toolforge hosts about 1,413 tools, and there are 1,700 maintainers, and these stats, I think, are from last month uh, or so. Those are from a little earlier, um, and 24.67% is the number of edits that bots and services that run on our infrastructure make to Wikimedia wikis, and that's the amount of 3.8 billion API requests, similar by bots and services that run our infrastructure to the wikis. And you've maybe not heard of the word cloud services before, but maybe you've already used it in some way or the other. Um, so this tool here, uh, Monumental, it is one of the Wikilove's monuments projects with a bunch of other projects that I'm not naming, but they're there. Um, and it basically allows you to explore monuments by location. Um, and it's cool and it's hosted on the Toolforge platform. Um, this is Wikisource export. If you use Wikisource, um, they have a tool that runs there that lets you export a Wikisource book to an EPUB or any other mobile reader format, and that runs on tools too. Uh, this is Outreach Dashboard, and I think this is its own little VPS project, and all of the program events um, for the outreach folks is handled here. Um, KWix, which is the Wikipedia offline project, all of their, they generate, um, the, the zim files that basically get used for their client side like apps and all the things that they have for making the offline Wikipedia available, like all the generation from the dumps happens on our end. And I think it is a tool, it's called the MW Offliner. Um, and this is the service that I talked about before, it's Quarry. Um, and you can see here it's just you write SQL in a graphical interface and it spits out the results as a table right beneath this, which maybe is not covered in the screenshot. <laughs> um, you may have heard of any of these tools. A lot of other things that you may have heard of today, like ORS, which is Aaron's um, AI project, all of those things were once hosted on labs um, or are still like, uh, or not labs. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the VPS projects will uh, provide like staging environments for those projects, even though even if they have graduated on to production. Um, yeah, and Brian is going to cover a bit more about how the team got formed and what the history is. Yeah, I'll ramble for a while. So, um, <laughs> the, the, you, you heard. Um, Mario would have to put a dollar in the swear jar for saying the lab's word. Um, so this, this environment that we're talking about, cloud services, was until April of this year called labs. And the thing that we're calling Toolforge now was until April of this year called Tool Labs. You may start to see that we had a little naming problem. Um, the team was also called labs, so the team was called labs, the environment was called labs, one of the things running in it was called tool labs, and nobody knew what the word labs really meant, other than it sounds either, depending on what kind of person you are, it either sounds sciencey and cool, or like mad experiments. Um, and over time, you know, things, things started out kind of in the mad experiment phase. So all the way back in, in 2005, Wikimedia Germany, Wikimedia Deutschland set up a, an environment that they called Tool Server. And this was a place for hosting tools, which um, whenever I say it, see the big air quotes around it. Tools is, is kind of a generic term in, in the movement for any piece of software that does anything that was written by anybody and runs anywhere. <laughs> uh, 
but specifically the tool server was set up to help people who were who were running some of the early bots and uh, some of the early web services that were helping augment what MediaWiki can do, right? We all know that there's limitations in MediaWiki and there's only so many things that you can get done inside it, but we have more complex workflows, especially social workflows that, that happen on the wikis. And people found that they needed to build extra things to help make lists of horrible things that needed to be cleaned up or make lists of good things that needed to be promoted or look around for gaps in coverage in, in some topic or area. So that's kind of where tools started. <coughs> and Wikimedia Deutschland folks um, took care of that environment for a long time, from 2005 all the way up there into, into 2013. The, that was a volunteer-run project that was funded in various and sundry ways. Um, jump forward a bit. Uh -oh. We jumped forward a bit to 2011. Uh, the Wikimedia Foundation, uh, Ryan Lane. Lane, thank you. <laughs> Too many Ryans. Ryan Lane uh, was an operations engineer at the Wikimedia Foundation. And he was into this software project called OpenStack that allowed you to take a pile of computers and turn them into this virtual cloud thing. Um, kind of like Amazon AWS hosting or Rackspace or a whole lot of other providers that, that are available in the world today. So he, he came in and, and pitched to, uh, to Mark Bergsma and Eric Muller that we should set up uh, a cloud environment at the foundation and that this environment should specifically be used to set up a replica of production that we could allow volunteer system administrators into and give them full root privileges and let them mess around and help build uh, the, the puppet manifests, the, the software that we use to automate software deploys to help build that, that project and system out and, and get elevated rights that we would have difficulty giving them on the actual production cluster. But since this was kind of a, a side testing environment and and hopefully it would be easy to recreate multiple projects that did almost the same thing and let people tweak things in different ways. We should build that out. So in 2011, they started building that. Uh, started with just Ryan in the beginning and then pretty soon after that, uh, Andrew Bogut, who is, is part of the current cloud services team, was hired to assist Ryan. And then things went on and it kept getting better and better. And in 2013, um, the, the tool server folks were having some, some growing pains issues. Their hardware was getting kind of old, and they were having some, some issues um, keeping their maintainer community vibrant, keeping the volunteers that were keeping everything under the hood running, keeping them from getting burned out and, and active and supported. And so they started talking to the foundation Probably actually in, in 2012, they started talking to the foundation, but in 2013, we finally did something about it. Uh, started talking to the foundation about the next generation of tool server and, and could it be, could it have more resources? Could it have some, some dedicated support? Were there other, some other things it could do? And so what happened in 2013 was that we realized that, that we had this labs environment and it was up and it was running this OpenStack cloud and it, it was being useful. And so we decided to found a project inside our, our OpenStack environment to become the replacement for Tool Server. And uh, Corin, uh, Mark Andre, Cole, okay. Okay, thank you, uh, was hired around that time to be part of this, this building out the new Tool Labs thing. Um, a whole lot of cool stuff happened. Then around 2014-ish, I think 2014-ish, Yuvi Panda came in uh, from, from another team. Uh, he was working on the Android team at the, at the time, building the Android mobile. Um, that project kind of got to its, its conclusion at that point, and he came over and became part of the Tool Labs group uh, inside the larger labs team and kept building things out. 
And we kept adding more resources, um, more uh, in, in 2016, Chase uh, became a dedicated manager of the team and it kind of broke out as, as uh, not just a couple, three people in the tech ops team, but actually became an official team inside tech ops with, with Chase as the HR manager. And also in 2016, I convinced my boss at the time, Toby Negrin, to let me jump ship out of my role as, as a manager of the reading infrastructure team and move over to the community tech team specifically so that I could work with the Tool Labs developer community and start to try to be kind of a, a developer liaison and, and a resource to, to build new things for them. And then uh, in 2017, in late 2016, Chase and I were talking at a, at a conference um, about a lot of the challenges that, that he was seeing from inside the team and I was seeing as somebody who was trying to like help promote and push Tool Forge forward, Tool Labs forward. Yeah, I can't even say the wrong names now, that's awesome. Um, so we, we started talking about the idea of, of taking this, this team that, that he was leading inside the technical operations group and this team of one that I had formed for myself inside Community Tech and merging them together and pitching uh, to solve several problems. And one of the problems that we really hit hard on in the, in the internal pitches that we gave to the foundation was this naming problem. That labs and tool labs didn't mean anything to anybody. Uh, that the, we, we actually have a page on Wikitech called Labs, Labs, Labs that, that UV started years ago that lists the many ways that the term labs was overloaded. And that when somebody just said labs without qualifying it as which labs, confusion ensued. <laughs> um, so that was a part of what we pitched. Another part of what we pitched was um, some of those numbers that, that were back on the slide that, that Madhu showed you, um, and they're up on the, the poster over there behind Chase, that what the real impact of these volunteer developed software projects was for the overall movement, right? When, when you see that number that, what is it, 24.6, 23? 24.6%. 24. That, so that was over a 90 day window across all projects, all 813 wikis. A quarter of the edits were made by software that volunteers ran inside what at that time was Chase's environment. Uh, there's there's some footnote numbers there, and, and I don't, you know, citation needed. I actually do have the citations. I can I can dig them up. Um, but 50% of the edits, a little bit over 50% of the edits to Wikidata during that same time window, were made from labs and tool labs. Um, and in case you think like, well, I mean, even a big project, and a big project like English with P is totally dominated by by human users, uh, the number was somewhere at 15%. Uh, I don't have the, the exact number off the top of my head, but the number was somewhere around 15% of the edits on English Wikipedia were, were made by bots. Um, so that led to this pitch inside the foundation, and uh, April 2017, we got, we got the green light that we were a real team. Um, and our job now is, you know, now we're called Cloud Services instead of the Labs team. Um, we're actually called the Wikimedia, Wikimedia Cloud Services team. <laughs> and we're in charge of the rebranded projects. Um, so the thing that was called Labs that meant OpenStack, not Labs that meant the team or Labs that meant something else, the thing that was called lab, Labs that meant OpenStack, we're now calling Cloud VPS. Um, and we picked that word, the, the VPS word, because we hoped that um, it means something to people who've never heard it before. Um, it may not mean everything to everybody, it's not a universal term, right? Um, but but it, it is something that means, means things in, in the world of software hosting. I'm probably taking way too long on this side. Um, virtual private server. Virtual private server, correct. And the rebranding of Tool Labs to Tool Forge. Uh, basically, once we started chasing the word labs, we want to get rid of it everywhere, because if we leave it anywhere, then we leave it and it never goes away. Uh, so so tool, tool Labs turns into Tool Forge, 
And then we started actually giving names to some other things that hadn't had names before, like wiki replicas had been called LabsDB, or the replicas, or the slaves, or the database, or <laughs> whatever. Um, ToolsDB was called ToolsDB when people thought of it as a thing in and of itself, but it often got lumped in with the wiki replicas as just the database, and not that it was special and distinct in, in that it, it provided different services. Um, and, and we've come to the point where we're also, uh, we're taking on some new responsibilities. So the dumps has historically been managed by um, Ariel and the ops team. And uh, they do a really great job of focusing on producing the dumps, but not never really were given many resources to worry about getting the dumps out to the world once they were produced. And so we're taking over that getting them out to the world side of it, and we're gonna we're gonna own. <coughs> we're starting to build the servers right now. We started just a couple weeks ago building new servers, new servers with bigger hard drives that are faster to hold the dumps, and we're gonna be taking over the HTTP interface and the NFS interfaces and the rsync interfaces and all the way that people get to these things. That's enough rambling around. We got next. We got architecture overview, and Chase would love to talk to you about architecture overview. Sure. Yeah. <coughs> I'll cue you on anything. Okay. Uh, this is a logical overview of things. Um, the tool for environment, which is sort of the in theory friendly environment that you can run something in, where you don't want to be responsible for. Full virtual machine. I mean, say you want to run a web service and you get a project and you have virtual machines, they have to be updated, they have to be maintained. Um, you have to pay attention to lists where we're emailing to like, know that we're going to be rebooting them or you know, that we're updating some portion on them. And there is overhead involved. So if you just want to do your thing, hopefully, uh, Toolforge is the place where you can do that. We have, I think, 1,200 or 1,300 of those tools are mostly web services, or at least we're fairly web service top heavy, um, which makes sense because a lot of it's uh, data availability or visualization or research output or you know, just web interfaces that some specific initiative needed some place to park. <clears throat> so within this project, we have Open Grid Engine, um, which is a distributed scheduling environments. Essentially, if you have some number of computers and you want a way to launch a job, you know, to run a web service or go crunch the numbers, you need to find a way to spread it out around a pool. Um, and Great Engine has the logic to do that. It knows how many things are running where, and it knows what nodes are busy and what nodes are not busy. And it knows how to find the place where your thing is most likely to be successful. You know, based on resources available. Kubernetes is, can perform very similar functions, but it's a little more modern. Um, it has the ability to constrain the resources that a job can actually use. So you want to run something and you say, I need a gig of memory. Grid Engine looks and sees where that exists and it ships you out there. But if it goes haywire and it uses five gigs and affects other people, there's not a lot of recourse, whereas Kubernetes has the ability to um, put a ceiling on resource usage, but then also track how many resources are being used, like how much compute time is, is being used by someone's web service or job. And that's those are numbers that we've sort of longed for over the last few years. People really want to know, understandably, how much bandwidth it is, you know, how many hits does a certain website get, uh, how much CPU, how much memory. And Kubernetes gives us some of that for free, along with the fact that it's just a more modern container-based platform. Right? And container's a big word, but essentially it means that you can wrap up your tool in this little package and ship it out, and you don't have to concern yourself with what everyone else is doing with the <coughs> So this all runs as a project, but the project itself isn't special other than that it's really big. I don't know what percentage of VPS's tools, but I 
think it's 125 virtual machines and we have 715, so it's 18% or something like that. Um, <clears throat> but we have 212 other projects that people are running and some portion of that, I don't know, 20 or 30% are, you know, internal initiatives, right? People want to rewrite a new command and control application that we want to use in production, but the majority are volunteer run or at least volunteer and staff collaborative projects. Um, there's tons of things happening in the maps realm. I don't know all of them other than they're busy. Uh, <laughs> Quarry is the sort of um, dumps MySQL exploration uh, tool where you can see what queries other people have run. You can kind of cobble together queries from examples you found. Uh, and it's it's a way so that what's in front of you isn't a black screen with a cursor. Um, mm -hmm. UV, when he wrote it, he has a very uh, accessible accessibility mindset, and one of his taglines is that you don't have to pay the command line tax, which is mm -hmm. having all of the context it takes to get up to the very last inch of what you actually wanted to do, which was just to run one query to find out one little thing, right? So in theory, this jumps you to 90%, because everybody has a web browser. Um, and then tools, which is kind of the meta there. But other than sort of, we, we started viewing these as products um, for ourselves and so we can communicate outward. So we call this the platform as a service, which is a fairly industry standard term. Um, this is infrastructure as a service, which is fairly industry standard. So is VPS, um, but that's it's actually an old term it's been used since the like 80s. Um, and then data services is, is sort of the category of things that fuel these fires, so to speak. A lot of the reason that people come to tools or people start a project is to get easy access and to get free compute resources to look at the data that's available. Um, <clears throat> so the wiki replicas um, are essentially sanitized copies of and people do really crazy number crunching, looking at editor retention and all kinds of things. The super popular stats page that's been around for a million years that we're putting oodles of work into recreating that has all been done forever by volunteers using you know open resources. Um, dumps everyone knows about. The sidebar there is essentially we have dumps for the world and then we've been making copies of that to present to this environment and we're just collapsing all of it because um, it makes sense, it's economical. And then shared storage is sort of the underpinnings of, of the entire tool forge environment. But then we also have like shared scratch space if you need you know, some place to park a terabytes worth of temporary data and stuff. One question. Please. What's the difference between replicas and dumps here? Okay, so if you go to dumps.wikimedia.org, there's a web page and you can download a bunch of static files essentially and the archives, there's all kinds of stuff there. Um, so those are files that you could download and unpack and kind of dig through, right? Um, we offer those in our environment as well via NFS. So like instead of so they're pretty large storage wide. Um, I swear I get to the answer. They're pretty large storage wide, um, storage wise. So not everyone has to have their own copy of these static flat files, right? The wiki replicas are real time live replicas that are constantly receiving updates from production as things are happening. So like one I don't want to use a bad use case, but I can't think of a better. But um, basically, let's just say you want to watch every edit as it happens, you know, for some patrol reason. This is not the way that you should do that. But many moons ago, that was really seemed to have been very common because it's easy to understand that as changes are made to the database and they are replicated, that you can consume them and go take action. Right? Now we want you to use RC Stream or whatever they do RC. What is it? Event stream. Event stream. Please use event stream. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so this is not happening, but can't um, use the, the music. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, so the difference is, is like one is a uh, built and 
place is a completely static file that doesn't change. I think we generate dumps twice monthly. So like every few weeks, we have a job that runs that you know takes everything, kind of combines it, and drops the file. And we do have people who um, unpack those and dig through for statistics or um, to build specific visual interfaces to historical data. Um, the use cases for LabsDB tend to be more dynamic. Like if you want to build query, <coughs> Corey has the ability to run ad hoc queries, you know, and you want to do that on some kind of structured query language back in format, so it makes sense that just hits um, my SQL level. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. I think the, the other one major difference that maybe was buried in what Chase said, but maybe was buried is that the wiki replicas do not contain the actual wiki text of the pages. So it's all the metadata about all the edits and things that happen, but there's no actual wiki text there. The dumps contain not only the current revision, but all the historical revisions wiki text. So like the, the dump XML file for Barack Obama yep. is the many, many, many megabytes long, and it's if you page through every revision of every history of Barack Obama, it's all collected in one ginormous file that you can Yeah, that does have a lot of historical um, One neat thing about the dumps um, kind of revitalization is right now, I believe we have three historical iterations of dumps available to our users. Whereas as we combine platforms, um, we're hoping that people can access you know, just everything that we have, which would be seven at the moment. And then there's also a lot of data on dumps that um, isn't accessible from this environment that hopefully will be nearly for free as we combine platforms. So if we wanted to use Quarry to analyze uh, content pages, we wouldn't be using replicas because that's just metadata. Yeah, so Quarry, Quarry today cannot actually access page content, so you can't do things like show me all the pages that have template X. Um, you can do things if there's metadata about it. So you can do things like show me all the pages that use image Y because there's a special metadata tracking table that keeps track of what image is used on what content page. Um, and there's also special tracking tables for like what pages link to each other. So you can ask it questions like that, but you can't ask it like find me all the pages that include the phrase Fumar Baz somewhere in, in the content. Corey is just uh, in front of Wikipedia figures. Like it's, uh, you don't have to have SSH access to log into a server and run the same query. You just log in somewhere with your OAuth, you can detect or meta credentials, and then you just run the query. But the database is the same. It's the same. Yeah. Yeah. The reason for no content, as I understand it, is essentially resourcing that. Um, Manuel, is that? Yeah, it's essentially that like to rehost all of the content for all of the wikis <laughs> is a sort of intractable problem where we can offer you all the metadata and you can just make API calls to production. Which there are a lot of tools that do that. Like figure out what you want based on kind of sifting through the piles of rubble and then you just can use all the API all the time to see the actual content. Um, I can hit a couple of these and then leave you guys some. Sure. Uh, all right. So um, multiple zones for uh, cloud VPS. This is a big one. This was a big part of uh, our pitch um, to sort of leverage more resources or look for more resources. Right now, um, the Google Media Foundation has a number of data centers, right? And we run through testing where if one of the data centers were to disappear, we could move to another one. All of this, the stuff that makes not quite 25% of all the edits, and those are disproportionately valuable edits because a lot of that is copy control and vandalism control that have drowned the rest of the 75% of the edits by people. Um, all of that is currently physically run out of one single data <laughs> and that's very problematic. 
at least as far as uh, robustness is concerned. And the main problem is that the underpinning of this platform, the OpenStack stuff, it's sort of operating in a legacy mode that the main projects have moved away from. And we never had the uh, extra time or the time to kind of put in the work to climb that mountain. We were just, you know, treading water. Uh, so when we talk about like, can we fail the wikis over if uh, the primary data center disappears? Well, you can, but you're going to lose all of the tooling that people have spent the last decade, you know, working on to actually make the ecosystem viable. Um, <clears throat> so zone is just a designator for um, particular components of the environment where we can sort of have virtual machines that are run out of physical places, right? So like run out of East Coast, run out of Central US, and that allows us to hopefully be real robust beyond geographic events, you know, like giant storms or hurricanes or whatever. Things that you definitely want all you don't want all of your egg in one basket. <clears throat> um, modern and robust networking is a big part of that. That's essentially the problem. That's the reason why we can't um, have things that exist outside of this one location, is the networking model is old and has been moved away from me. Uh, and now I'm going to let Madhu talk about the dumps and the quality doc stuff. I'm sure. Uh, I also wanted to pause at the moment and ask if there were questions before we ramble on about all of the stuff that we're about to do in the future. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering when you say um, that we help people post tools, tools that are going to add value to the Wikimedia ecosystem, how do you decide that a tool is going to add value? Who decides that and whether that process will also be affected by the environment or not? Yeah, it's, it's, that's a pretty good question. It, it's, it's an <laughs> awesome question. Uh, so the, 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 the process of deciding right now today is um, that there's a, a, there is a tool within Toolforge called the admin tool. And everyone who's a maintainer of the admin tool has the rights to grant new people into the overall project. Um, and we have, there's a web-based workflow for that that's that's managed through toolsadmin.wikimedia.org. So that's where you go to to apply for tools membership. And when you do, there's basically kind of an echo-like notification that goes out to all the admins. Um, and uh, as to how we decide, basically, if you can say anything that makes sense about what you're going to do, we'll <laughs> let you in. Um, it, it's a really low barrier. So uh, ideally, it would be a transparent barrier. Right? Like ideally, it would be the wiki way, and we'd let people in, and we'd let them try to do something, and if it turned out to be a bad thing, we'd undo it, right? Just like we undo a bad edit on the wiki. It turns out, it, in our software resourcing and our tooling, it's a little harder to undo bad things. Um, so there's just this very low level, like some other human has to click a button that says, okay, I thought about this for five seconds and sure they're in. Um, I think in the amount of time that I've been helping judge these applications, um, maybe seven of them have been denied. And in that same amount of time, probably 250, 300, 400, maybe even have been approved. Um, Mostly the, the things that we deny end up being people who say, um, I need to use your computers so that I can build some for-profit project that has absolutely nothing to do with Wikimedia. Or um, they wanted to play closer software, which we don't Or they wanted to play closer software, or um, a couple of times it's basically just been um, somebody who really didn't write anything in the why, and so we left a note and said, Please tell us more, and then 
after a month that they don't respond, then I just close it as decline and figure if they come back tomorrow, they can open up a new one and, and say why. That's that's mostly tools. Yeah. But we also do. I mean, there's two levels, right? You can you get an account and you can say, hey, I need my own project, which is just an allocation of quota to go do things. Or you can say, I just want to join tool the tool for a project because you know. I'm just looking to run one specific thing. Um, and applying for a project would basically require who are you, what are you trying to do, and why. And almost always, the main reason we're asking why you want to do it is because someone else might already be doing it and we're going to point their way. Or you may not quite understand what you're asking and what you've described as inhumanly possible or technologically possible. Um, or Maybe, yeah, you would, you would be a bad actor if you were in the system, right? You would close our software or some kind of for profit thing. We're essentially a niche hosting environment um, with a lot of big problems. One of the questions that came up when we were pitching the branding and, and using the cloud term and sort of consolidating on industry standard terms is how do you, um, you know, better out bad actors? how do you make sure someone doesn't run a business off of this platform? You know what I mean? Like, how do you make sure someone is acting in bad faith? And the answer that we gave then and then is, well, we, we pretty much have a lightweight contextual barrier to entry. We understand what people are doing on the platform. We don't, you know, we're not over their shoulder after that. But for the most part, the users of the platform themselves have way more knowledge, insight, and context into what's happening. I mean, most of the time when someone is doing something like using external resources that leave user IPs, it's other Toolforge volunteers who are probably editors, probably on Wiki Active, and they're the ones who see the issue and call it out. Um, so I think in general, sorry this kind of long, I think in general, myself and Andrew, um, there was a time when it was just he and I, and we had a discussion. And we really don't feel like we're the arbiters of what's valuable to the projects. You know what I mean? Like, in some ways, you could be standing in that role, but that's not our thing. Our thing is more like technical reality. Like, are you describing a thing which you could actually do here? And can you describe it to me in a way to which I understand? Sounds good to me. Um, so it's a very low barrier to entry, sort of litmus, smell test, slash, you know, actual feasibility. provide better support for our communities of volunteer developers. 
Um, we, we've been doing an, an okay job for several years of making sure that there are computers and the computers are up and that they're running. Um, but we kind of want to go beyond that and try to help uh, help new people learn how to use the things better, uh, help people who have built things better promote the things that they've built to other developers and to people on Wiki and to people off Wiki. Um, we want to do a better job of, um, of simplifying things, of, of following those those things that, that UV was, was really kind of a groundbreaking champion for uh, inside the foundation about, about simplifying things where they can be simplified and streamlining uh, the, the processes that, that volunteers have to go through. Um, they, the, the thing there that I kind of, I, I talk about internally quite a bit is that there's, there's a very large difference between um, Greg, Greg sitting over here in the corner and Greg's release engineering team is a very, very heavy user of, of cloud VPS services. So the, the, the Jenkins build testing system runs on cloud VPS. The beta cluster that's our, our near real-time continuous integration environment runs on cloud VPS. Um, several other initiatives that they've, they've worked on right on cloud VPS. So there's a really big difference between when, when Greg's team, who's primarily paid software engineers and the employee of the Wikimedia Foundation, the time that they have to invest in learning how the tooling works and taking care of things and keeping them running, versus the time of our average tool developer who maybe figures out how to take four hours of a Saturday afternoon, one weekend a month, to work on making a cool thing that makes it easier to do something, some workflow on the wikis. Um, it's kind of our job, I think, yeah, as, as providers of that platform to, to work at making it more and more often that when they sit down to spend those four hours, that they get to spend three hours and 50 minutes of it doing something cool and only 10 minute of it, minutes of it doing something boring and repetitive. Um, and without some care and feeding of that, it, it quickly becomes the other way. That every time you sit down to touch the thing, it takes you three hours to figure out what am I supposed to do, and then you're only left with an hour to do the cool thing that you came to, to make everything better. And so that's a lot of that. Like the better workflows are account creation, better documentation for new people, hiring a tech support contractor, and even like consolidation of platforms is, is all towards that, that kind of idea about just get as much of the mess out of the way as we can uh, or take it on ourselves so that, so that the volunteers who are spending those very, very precious hours can spend them doing good things rather than doing housekeeping. That's a good idea, we should do that. All right, <laughs> let's put it on the list. I'll get it in the end complete. Five minutes. Five minutes. All right. What do we got left? Uh, Aha. Uh -huh. Wiki replicas upgrade. So, uh, we didn't really talk about this much yet, but this is a big thing, and, and our our brilliant DBA team has been working for I, how, how, many, how many months have you been working on this? Half a year. Yeah. So, uh, in these, these real-time replicas uh, of the wikis that we have, uh, one of the historical problems is that MediaWiki's database structure itself is a little unique. <laughs> and, and, and making copies of it, making redacted copies of it. So, when, when we copy it into, into the cloud data services environment, um, we can't just take a complete binary copy of what's running in production and put it out where, where all our volunteers can access it because there's data inside there that's, that's special protected data, right? Like, um, probably a lot of you that work on the wikis know something about check user and that check user means scary and there's something about IP addresses and privacy. 
So we have to take that kind of data that, that's, that's very privileged data that, that people aren't normally allowed to see, and we have to remove it from the database copies that, that we allow people to get to. And this process historically has, has made it um, difficult and um, error prone to keep up to date with changes. Sometimes when rows are deleted, and when data is deleted or marked as, as deleted in production, it doesn't get marked as deleted in, in the replica databases. And sometimes even when things get added in production, they don't get added properly in, in the replicas kind of because of all the crazy mechanisms. So, long story long, <laughs> the, uh, the DBA team thought about this a lot and, and tried to think about ways to make it better. And they came up with um, a whole bunch of changes in, in the tooling pipeline that they use and the actual way that the data servers are set up and deployed and maintained to make it more robust and, and easier to keep track of. And then, once they had that set up, they had a many, many month process of refilling those databases with all the copies of the production data run through the new pipeline to clean out the, the, the things that we aren't allowed to show you because they're privacy invasive somehow. And just last week, we finished and we got all the data pushed in and now we have them keeping up to date with new data changes as they come in. So we have a new, a new set of servers um, that we hope are, well, they're, they're bigger, faster hardware, so that's a good start. Uh, but we hope that they're also more reliable copies of what's in production, that there will be less likely to be deltas between what you can see on the wiki and what you can see in the replica. Um, and so now what we need to do is we need to get some people who are existing users in, in tool labs and labs of the data of these databases of the, the existing WikiDBs to switch over and start using these new wiki replica databases so that we can kind of break them in and make sure that, that the performance characteristics that we hope are there are actually there and shake out any problems that we might have with changes that we did in the permissions model and things like that, that you're not seeing things that you expect to see. Hopefully we won't find any where you're seeing things you don't expect to see, but we also need to look for that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so we're kind of putting out a call to existing <coughs> users, and we're going to start doing this with, with a, we're going to do a, we'll do a technical blog post in a couple of weeks, and a mailing list push once the whole Wikimedia craziness dies, dies down, get people to use them, and then hopefully within a couple of months we'll be able to switch over and make these the real copies that everybody's using all the time and solve some kind of long-standing problems. Uh, I know. The difference uh, between the two? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so the existing setup is interesting in that, say you want to connect to a specific wiki, you have some DNS magic to make that easy um, or at least achievable, and you can find a specific wiki, but then you run your query or do whatever. You have, there are protection measures in place so that you don't take up a disproportionate amount of resources. Um, but all of those users are kind of lumped in. You've got people doing, they want to be long-term uh, analytic stuff, and we have people running web services. And so part of the idea of the switchover is to hopefully separate the use cases to be more friendly to all so that you know, um, a web service isn't tripping over long running analytics queries and vice versa. So these two service URLs are part of the transition and we're hoping that people will be able to point to the right place and that on the back end that allows us to make more friendly decisions for users. Um, some minor trivia and, and you know it's mostly commodity hardware and scaling up horizontally and all that, but these are actually, at least at the time, the most expensive servers the foundation had ever purchased. <laughs> so, because, partially because the existing setup just gets hammered, you know, like we need a lot of firepower um, to allow users to not constantly be bumping their heads. So, we owe the DBAs pretty big debt of gratitude, the entire Spanish DBA team. <laughs> I've been working on this for six months. <laughs> Every database administrator in Spain. 
has been dedicated to this project. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's just a cloud service stack, and then it shows up on our board somewhere, and Brian will try it. 